I think our society is absolutely drowning in this insinuation, this snarky insinuation that you're stupid if you believe. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, whether I don't know who Trojan horsed it first, whether it was atheism or secularization or so on and so forth, I, I think there's some strong arguments that there's positives for and against. But one of the things against where our society has turned is is that we really kind of have this in the back of our mind, this insinuation that you're stupid if you believe. That you have to suspend and, disbelief uh, extremely in order to believe that there's God or the Bible could be mm -hmm. true or anything. Yeah, like and one of the things I like about the project that you guys are doing is I'm looking at all of this footage and I'm looking at all these uh, claims and these artifacts and these uh, stories that you're coming up with, especially with this archaeologist Jim Gee. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is showing how you don't have to be stupid if you believe, and you don't have to suspend dis disbelief to trust what some of these ancients were saying. And I mean, that's not to say that we subscribe necessarily to this idea that, you know, everything every ancient person wrote was not symbolic, you know, mm -hmm. but it does amaze me how much these evidences you're coming up with end up making ancient scripture, especially scripture uh, from around 600 BC, like the Old Testament and the first chapters of the Book of, Man Book of Mormon are, mm -hmm. uh, how how good it makes it look. Yeah, it makes it come alive. Yeah, it not mm -hmm. only just makes it come alive, which is always fun, but just I'll give you one example that piqued my interest, and then maybe you guys can talk about other examples mm -hmm. in, in your project. But I was involved in a project once uh, studying anachronisms, and there was this archaeologist who had published some papers. Let, let's explain. I'm going to explain anachronism, because I didn't know what that was yes, for a long do time. Tell, so do tell. An anachronism, for anyone listening, is something that doesn't fit in the time period that it's said. So, like, if for example, I was like, hey, uh, George Washington, we, we have a letter from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson talking about how he subscribed to his YouTube channel. Then yes. we'd be like, oh, that's obviously a fake letter because there wasn't YouTube back then. They only had MySpace, right? Yeah. So, it, so <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. If somebody, if somebody comes yeah. up with a letter saying, oh, you know, George Washington subscribed to my MySpace account, then yeah, obviously yeah. we know it wasn't of ancient origin. Actually, uh -huh. I shouldn't even say ancient, yeah, but it wasn't yeah. of historical origin, but mm -hmm. it was a modern forgery and it was uh -huh. a fraud because yeah. Obviously, MySpace nor YouTube exist back then. With that said, I remember when YouTube had a star rating system. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't know if you remember this, Andrew. I don't know if you remember this. Other guys in the studio, but I was there when YouTube was just a baby. Yeah. Okay, so um, shout out to anybody that remembers when you could actually rate the movie. And the number one video was not political; it was shoes. And yeah, anybody oh, yeah, listening that guy. that remembers yeah. shoes, shoes, you know, all I have to say I is shoes. shoes. <laughs> yeah. And then everybody knows exactly what video I'm talking about. So it's hard to believe that was like less than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so yeah, one of the things that piqued my interest in this project was a previous project I'd work on because I love archaeology. I am that geek who wishes he were a modern Indiana Jones that mm -hmm. will actually read the stand. Yeah. Yeah. Jason. At one point I was literally taking free class. Uh, I was signed up to take free Hebrew classes at the central synagogue in New York city. Yeah. Just because I want to be able to read the Dead Sea Scrolls in their original tongue uh -huh. without a translator. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how absolutely I will geek out on some of these ancient scripture things. But everybody's not that way. So anyway, I was involved in another project where uh, there was a bunch of you know academics basically talking down to anybody that believed the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Because, oh, lions were an anachronism. That there were no lions in ancient Israel that had to have been in either symbolic or a made-up story or whatever. And what was so interesting is until only recent times, people actually kind of took that route in mm -hmm. their lack of archaeological evidence of any of the lions they were aware of being in the Holy Land in ancient Israel. They kind of thought, OK, well, it has to be that way until they started digging up ruins that actually had this species of lion that we now call the Eurasian or the Asiatic, Asiatic. lion, mm. which was like three quarters the size of the big ones that we have now in the zoo and apparently roamed all over Eastern Europe and uh, down to Syria mm -hmm. and Lebanon and Israel. But due to the fact that they uh, unfortunately were a threat to the expanding human civilization, they were, all they, yeah, they were ultimately mm -hmm. hunted out by the warrior class. And so all the people that actually believed Daniel – and the lion's den because of a spiritual witness or a spiritual connection with the story ended up being justified 
and uh, being shown that they weren't stupid because they believed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel what's so interesting is your project, one of the reasons why I'm intrigued by it is because it really does open those doors showing, wow, you know, you're not crazy for thinking, okay, Lehi traveled through the desert, made it to the Red Sea, came to the land bountiful, and then crossed the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, And those opening chapters of the Book of Mormon are just like in the Old Testament. It it really does open doors. So um, why don't you just Let's give a little explanation of the Book of Mormon a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, So as we've kind of seen from the beginning of, uh, I guess, when it was published, the Book of Mormon, the history of it is we believe that in around 1820 – a boy named Joseph Smith was visited by heavenly figures and was called as a prophet of God. And that calling included to bring to pass the restoration of the church of Jesus Christ that he established on the earth um, with him at the head and 12 apostles. And a fruit of that calling was a translation of an ancient record um, of the inhabitants of the American continent. And in which this, is now the Book of Mormon, which is right? now okay. the, Book the Book of Mormon. Mormon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, when this book was published, actually there were in many, 1830. in 1830. Since then, for, to now, from 1830 to now, there's been about 204 an, anachronisms that have been brought up by the well, critics. Well, of you the would Book say a, alleged, alleged anachronisms. anachronisms. Exactly. They were at the time when they when yeah. when they made these claims. There weren't evidences for these 204 things. Mm-hmm. But since then, 170 of them have been proven to not be anachronisms. So that stands with wow. only 34 more that exist. So this, this Joseph Smith guy, because here, here's the claim that he made, that there was an ancient book that was of ancient origins, and he translated by the power of God. And the book that he translated had 204 things that didn't exist at the time, at, at, at his time. Yeah. And... Now that's now that's been changed. Like now we see that 170 of them actually did, and so either he was good at guessing 170 yeah. unique things in thus the Book far. of Mormon thus far, or maybe he was telling the truth. So if I were to summarize what you're saying for anybody that's just recently mm-hmm. tuning in, that um, the very first uh, prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, nowadays commonly referred to as the Mormon Church, uh, translated a book called the Book of Mormon that purports mm-hmm. to be of ancient origins. And from its inception, the critics of the church, specifically the critics of the Book of Mormon, have pointed to what they perceive as anachronisms of an evidence of its fraudulent nature or its pious fraud or mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. he was created crazy. Um, and we've seen different lists, some of them saying there's 200 of them or 300 of them. But at the, as time goes on, uh, any forensic scientist, any uh, investigator, any detective will tell you that frauds only look worse over time. You're saying that the reverse is happening. Yes, that exactly. Of these in 200 acronisms in a big way, we're finding more and more and more and more evidence that actually supports the possibility of Lehi's journey as stated in the Book of Mormon and as translated by Joseph Smith mm-hmm. than any evidence against it. So that's a very bold claim, obviously. I, I mean, I can hear people booting up their laptops to already start blogging against you <laughs> yes, right now. I, I, I can hear them. Uh, in your project, just d- describe to us possibly what are one of those anachronisms that you feel, um, I guess you could say debunked. Yes. And, and also before you go into that, um, tell us a, the bird's eye view of, of what you did. I mean, you went to Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Um, this was not a Boy Scout trip. No, you know no, what I'm far saying. From it. Like so, so why don't you tell us what and what's your okay. favorite yeah, anachronism yeah, yeah. that you kind of feel you debunked, and then give us a, a, a an overview of of the rest of the the week you spent in Israel. Yeah. So the overview, I'll give the overview first, and then Jackson will share one of the cool anachronisms that was debunked in our in our series, but. Uh, in the beginning of the Book of Mormon, it starts off with this guy named Lehi. He lives in Jerusalem, 600 BC, right before the Babylonians come in and destroy it. So that's actually Old Testament times. The same okay. time as like Ezekiel. So anyone who reads the Bible, or Ezekiel Jeremiah. and Jeremiah were happening at that same time, right? Okay. And so Lehi, I'm calling my rabbi buddy up, yeah. and I'm fact checking you right now. <laughs> Lehi, honey, we're coming. Yeah. No, it's kidding. Lehi, <laughs> and he gets a command to leave Jerusalem because uh, it's going to be destroyed. Now, so he leaves uh, from 
Jerusalem and he travels for around 10 years. We don't know exactly, but at least 10 years until he gets to the coast of the Arabian Peninsula where he goes to where he finds this tropical land that at the time uh, when Joseph Smith made this or when this claim was made in the Book of Mormon, everyone thought Joseph Smith was crazy for putting it in there because there's no such thing as a tropical land on the Arabian Peninsula. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But he travels there, comes to the Americas, and then uh, they populate the land and, and split off into the Nephites, Lamanites, and, and that's and the rest that's the is beginning history. And the rest okay. is history, right? So, so we started the beginning of that journey. We're going to continue it through Yemen and Oman later this year. But we went from Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, traveled with camels, and, and visited the archaeological sites on the way. So, so if I understand you correctly, you're saying that if you actually read carefully the mm-hmm. opening chapters of the Book of Mormon – there's enough clues of him stating where he went yes. in what is now modern day Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. And what was the other place you mentioned? Oh, we're going to be going to Yemen, Yemen. and Oman. Yemen and Oman. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can actually follow, I guess what we would uh, colloquially call, colloquially, oh man, that's always a word I can never pronounce. Colloquially. Colloquially, oh man, that that was not meant for the the, the human mouth. Yeah. So, um, in layman's terms, we can call that um, Lehi's trail. Mm-hmm. So, as dictated in the Book of Mormon, Lehi's journey goes through Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and then to Oman and Bountiful. Mm-hmm. And that you have done the first three steps of those five countries, yeah. tracing those, um, tracing that journey. And you feel that you've been able to debunk some of the critics along yeah. the way. The this best is way to figure out if it's true is by actually going and going. So is this route, the right? steel swords you talked so, yeah, about so in the pre-show? Yeah, so is this the about. okay? So yeah. hit us hit exactly. Us. So when the Book of Mormon first was published, um, in the beginning chapters, a story is described in which one of the main characters named Nephi he comes across this man that has a steel sword with a golden hilt. Now, at the current time, and honestly, not until very recently. So you mean in the 1830s when exactly. people were first discovering the Book of Mormon reading it? Okay. Exactly, yes. And so not until recently, uh, steel swords were never have thought to have existed in that time period. They actually, you know, it was a general consensus that they didn't exist. And When the Book of Mormon was published. Exactly, yes. when the Book of Mormon was published. But since then, with uh, further archaeological research, um, there was a sword discovered um, in, called, the 80s. in the 80s called the Jericho Sword. Now, if you look up a picture of this online, you'll probably see just basically a rusted out piece of rebar is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. And only it's really through, old. Only through chemical analysis were they able to determine that, yes, indeed, it was made of steel. However... And dated to 700 BC, which predates the Book of Mormon. Exactly. Okay, well, what'd you guys find? I mean, you didn't go to Jericho, right? Exactly. Well, we were near there, but we went out uh, in our travels in Jerusalem. The infield expert in which uh, we we brought with us named Jim Gee, he's been doing work over there for about 25 years now. And he's become really good friends with all the uh, antiquities experts. And in a private collection... Is that collection, the guy named Aladdin? Yeah, Aladdin. Oh, man, that yeah. is so cool. We his, actually met a real Aladdin. His, that name, is great. Is Aladdin. Yeah. his uh-huh. name is Aladdin, but he goes by Alan because he thinks that it's... Yeah, because he lived in San Francisco. <laughs> he totally Americanized his name and his street signs, and he's crushing it yeah, in the yeah, antiquities, yeah. dude. Exactly. Okay, yeah. And so in his private collection, he had a Damascus steel sword with a silver hilt that they chemically... Uh, an, analyzed that dated back to 6th century BC. 6th to 9th century BC. So within 300 years, fits the narrative perfectly with the Book of Mormon, showing that that first off, steel exists. Second off, it was made uh, into sword form. And third, that precious metals were used as hilts and uh, during that time period as well, which yeah, especially for none very of that existed important. when the Book of Mormon was translated. Wow, no that one is, knew that. And, and this is this is all just kind of uh, breaking news, shall we say? Like archaeology is a very slow thing. Yeah, we haven't shared you know, this sword but, with the world yet. It, you you can't Google it and find it. We we're going to be showing it in the docu series for the first time. 
Interesting. So one of the earliest claims against the narrative of Lehi's journey through the desert, Mm -hmm. um, dating all the way back to the 1830s, you say is a lot of people saying, oh, well, steel couldn't have existed. By the way, there's there's such a bias to that. Like we do have a modern bias thinking like the ancients. We're the smartest. Yeah, the ancients just – you look at dynastic Egypt and they were able to manufacture things better than we did using – who knows what tools? Yeah, are. We using don't, we don't know. tools and protocols that we do not understand to this day that blow yes. my mind. So mm-hmm. I just I have to strip myself of modern presentism and modern bias. Mm-hmm. But you're saying that one of the first arguments against the Book of Mormon was naysayer saying, "Well, steel couldn't exist." Mm-hmm. And nowadays it's we look at knowledge. Think, oh yeah, that's modern bias. But you're saying that you have not just shown that steel swords exist, but they existed in a way that is almost as exactly described in yes. scripture. It, almost exactly. In the book Mar- and this is coming out in your docu series. Yes. yes. And, and guess what? The guy who has the sword and who shared all these things, he's not a Mormon guy. He's a Muslim guy. And he didn't even know why we were interested in, interested the sword, in the sword. But he, the way he describes it all, um, is exactly. But that that's just one of the ed- evidences, Card. And we have we have a, a bunch more that we want to go through. Okay, and we're cool. Share. Well, um, guys, stay with us. We're in the studio right now with Hayden Jackson Paul. Their project is called The Stick of Joseph. They're uh, talking about archaeological evidences, the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Book of Mormon, specifically Lehi's journey. This is intriguing stuff. We're going to catch you on the other side of this commercial break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a special broadcast on AM 1220 KHTS and FM 98.1. Uh, we're talking about a new documentary project called The Stick of Joseph. I am your host, Cardin Ellis, and I am joined today in the studio by the executive producer and the hosts of this project, Hayden and Jackson Paul. Uh, Before this uh, commercial break, we were talking a little bit about uh, some of the really interesting anachronisms they're debunking, some of the uh, historical evidences of the Old Testament, New Testament, the Book of Mormon that they're coming up with, and uh, it's it's been intriguing. We're gonna we're gonna dive right back in, but before we do, um, you know, I know you guys remember the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and you know, supposedly they're like less than one percent of the population Mm -hmm. uh, of all of California. I swear it's probably at least three percent of Santa Clarita. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? But you know, why, why do you think this would be of interest to just the average bear and the average listener? What, what, what is the draw? I can see why, why my Mormon buddies might find this interesting, yes, but what would course. be the draw for the average awesome town listener? That's a great question, Cardin. And, what, and the answer to that is because the implications that this has on the rest of the Christian world, if the Book of Mormon is in fact what it propones to be, a purports. purports to Are be. you mixed pr- yeah. proposes and purports? <laughs> purports to and be. And supposes into propose, <laughs> which was really awesome. You know, the things that military guys can yeah, get away exactly. with. Exactly. So, anyway. so if it is in fact what it purports to be, another testament of Jesus Christ, that is groundbreaking for the rest of the Christian world. Because think about if you you have your favorite movie, right? And then you find out that there's a sequel that has been made, but you had no idea about. Would you not like do everything you can to go and watch that, right? Yeah. And, and so if the Book of Mormon is truly another testament of Jesus Christ, this is... This is a sequel. Earth shattering sequel, sequels, yeah. right? The here, sequel right? of sequels. Okay, sequels, well, what do you say yes. then? Just we'll just get the controversial part out yeah. of the way right away before you dive into your other cool list of anachronisms that you've allegedly debunked. Yeah. What would you say to the person that just summarily dismiss it, dismisses it and says, "Ah, oh, well, I believe Joseph Smith was a fraud. Therefore, the Book of Mormon could be true, and this mm-hmm. has got to be some kind of uh, modern hoax or so on and so forth." What would just the elevator pitch of your project be to somebody that is kind of taking that tack? That you know can't be real. So what? Move on. For sure. So first off, I would ask the person, have you read the Book of Mormon? Because that 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 is co- completely essential to be able to find out if something's true or false or whatever. Because in the Book of Mormon, you know, it says that the crowning event of the Book of Mormon is a personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the people of the Americas. That's that's big news. After his and resurrection. So if, if that's a possibility, you should probably read that that record and see if it holds water. Second, I would say okay. with the elevator pitch is a lot of the things that are said about Joseph Smith, about the Book of Mormon, um, are are told in the most biased light. And and I understand there's biases. Everyone has biases, but if you my radio career depends yeah, upon biases for sure. Right, so no, I'm just yeah. kidding. no, and, and so 
hear both sides of the bias and then make a decision. Now, I've I've read all of the, I'm, I'm not going to say all of the critics, but I have tried to expose myself to as many critics of the Book of Mormon and as much literature that is critical towards the Book of Mormon as I can. And I've read the Book of Mormon. And so it's by doing that, by holding both the critics and the, the, the pro Book of Mormon literature in your hand, that you can get a clear vision. And so that's what we're trying to do with this project, because unfortunately, a lot of people aren't reading these days. I don't know if you've you've noticed a lot of uh, the if reading. If it's not on TikTok, really it yeah, does not exist. Exactly. If it's not a if it's not a Netflix miniseries, then most people aren't going to even that's it, too you know long. What I mean? Yeah, even that's too long. I only so, watch the highlights yes. of the Netflix miniseries <laughs> on TikTok. So essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to share these evidences and both perspectives in a way that is consumable by most people these days, right? Because people will sit and they'll watch you know a five episode miniseries on a bunch of serial killers and they'll just consume that in one night right well maybe we can provide something that's a little bit more uplifting and and has a little bit more value than just uh than the majority of media and 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 give that to the people so that they can you know make a decision on this very very i understand how bold this claim is but we should at least take it seriously. And so what we're trying to do is show that there is enough preponderance of evidence that people should take it serious enough to at least read it and engage mm-hmm. with the text. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, we love bold claims here in Santa Clarita. We literally call ourselves Awesome Town. Yeah, really? Yeah. That's the name for it? Yeah. Like it's, it's literally – I don't I don't know if the Lego movie – Is that movie just you or does everyone? No, that's like literally – we make the bold claim that we are the best city in Los Angeles okay. County. So we dig bold claims. Now, we get flack for it, but – you know, Same hey, with us. <laughs> when it's when it's second place, you know what I'm saying. Of course, I throw flack at the the, the first placers too. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, Santa Clarita pride uh, pride aside, I, I, I find this intriguing. If I, I want to summarize what you basically said for anybody that might just be tuning in, that. Um, you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Book of Mormon is a controversial text purporting to be of ancient origin with naysayers that say, no way. So you decided, you and your brother, who have a uh, history in film, want to put that scripture to the test and actually go to Israel, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and then in the future, Oman and Yemen, to follow what the original characters in those first opening chapters of the Book of Mormon said they did Mm -hmm. to kind of put the text to the test. Is it fair to, I would say that your project, the stick of Joseph is putting the text of the Book of Mormon to the test and seeing if it passes archeological muster. Is is that what you're saying? Impeccable summarization. Okay. And, and before the commercial break, you said, uh, naysayers claiming that there could be no steel swords of ancient origin, like, uh, the Book of Mormon purports that there was in the hands of a man named Laban, uh, mm-hmm. wielded by uh, a prophet called Nephi, uh, that recent archaeological inquiry, very recent, has actually shown that you didn't need a blast furnace to do it, and that um, the ancients weren't dumb, and they actually had indeed made steel all the way up from the Crusader period of Damascus steel to about 900 BC. They're finding archaeological examples, and that's one of these anachronisms, or meaning one of these um, archaeological doubts, shall we say, that somebody had of the ancient origins of the Book of Mormon that you were able to kind of debunk. Yes. So, were there any others that you came up with, or are you just a one-trick pony? No. Yeah, that was it. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's it. We can, we're no, that's a commercial break right more. now. Okay, keep no, going. What there, else you got? There's way more. So one of them, I'll kind of set it up, and Jackson can explain how it was, uh, how it has been debunked. So in the Book of Mormon, what happens, there's this guy named Lehi. We explained this earlier, but a guy named Lehi is commanded to leave Jerusalem. So he leaves. He stops at a few places. And in his journey, he stops at a place that they called the Valley of Lemuel, a place that they called Shazer, and a place that they called the land bountiful. So there's three places that they stop where they say that they called it this, right? Okay. But there's one place that they stop that they say we stopped in a place called Nahum. N A H O S. So, so you're saying right? that these characters in Book Mormon, they named the places they went along. Uh-huh. However, there was a set of places that already carried like a local tribal name. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you can tell from the grammar of the Book of Mormon that that was a pre existing name, mm-hmm. not one that they came up with. Yes. Mm-hmm. And okay. it, 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 it was an existing place. Now, at the time of the Book of Mormon, when the Book of Mormon uh, was um, published, there wasn't. A place called Nahum, like an existing place. It, especially known to the Western world. And it's kind of hard for us to understand that with our Google Earth and Google Maps just yeah, right on our phones. Yeah, everything. 
you, you can yeah, figure out. Yeah, if you want to go to ancient maps, you go to map quest. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I mean, yeah. like, how do they just not map quest this? Okay? Yes. <laughs> and so these maps, especially ones of Arabia, because it really wasn't until World War I with Lawrence of Arabia that the Western world really explored the Arabian Peninsula. And, and documented and it. And documented it, right? And so the maps of that region of the world were very expensive and few and far between, if any at all, in the Western world at that it time. Would be Especially fair to say, in America. Yeah, so would it be fair yeah. to say those were like the Lamborghinis of the day? Exactly. That if you had a map, it meant that you could you afford it. You were balling. And you, yeah. Could yeah. you were a balling. You were a balling. So, okay, so yeah. the map makers were the for, uh, Enzo Ferraris of their time. Because it was expensive. Think about and this. Dude. Yeah, okay. You had to send someone across the world. They would spend years there drawing it out. Then they'd have to come back, etch their drawings into a piece of brass backwards – Right, because okay. it, it had to be a mirror image. Then they would uh, put ink on it, do an imprint, and then they would paint them. And so it's like so much effort and time was put into these. There really was just the wealthy that had access to maps at the time. So Nahum had been lost to the the Western world. So how do right? these no exact, how do these so, old school super yeah. expensive maps debunk the naysayers of the Book of Mormon? You say. So then our infield expert Jim Gee, who took us along this journey. He uh, served as a missionary of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints many years ago, and he read an article about this phenomenon of Nahum having been an already established place, right? Okay. And so he decided right then and there that he was going to be the one to discover a map of Nahum. And so he set out and up until now has found four ancient maps, some that date back to even the 1700s, that have Nahum. Not necessarily ancient maps, and not ancient maps, <clears throat> well, it, of the ancient world. Yeah, of the yeah. ancient world. These maps that um, date back hundreds of years that um, have Nahum, not only in the same ge geographical place on each of these different maps, but in the same geographical place as described in the journey of the Book of Mormon. Oh, interesting. So, if I understand you correctly, you're saying, okay, a lot of the naysayers of the possibility of Lehi's journey say, look, th this had to have been a made-up story. It's all made up. Which means, mm -hmm. if it's a made-up story, then that would mean Joseph Smith would have had to have invented, or at least very luckily guessed, uh, what's this place called again? Nahum. Nahum. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would have had to have guessed not only the name Nahum, but where it was. That's like saying, for example, if <laughs> I understand correctly, that some guy made a book in uh, 2135 about Southern California where he just correctly guessed that there was a town called Santa Clarita that he just correctly guessed was a 45-minute car drive north of Los Angeles, an hour and a half in bad traffic. And never saw a map of it. And never saw a map of it. Yes. Okay. Never been there before. And, and then this archaeological researcher, Jim Gee, has since found not just one lucky guess, but multiple mm -hmm. of these commissioned ma maps from what it sounds like they're coming from a lot of them are from the 1700s but they're, Gutenberg they use time, they, use, they like. use uh source maps that were from even earlier so some mm -hmm. of them so like carson niebuhr he he was one of the uh the french map makers he went over there and nahum still kind of exist it had mostly been disbanded and destroyed but there was still a group of people that they called themselves wait wait so this is nahum. huge so so you're trying to say you're saying that not ancient map makers again. We don't know when yeah, the term yeah. ancient starts. But w when is the oldest map that this archaeological researcher found from? What um, year? More or less. What it's century? 1700. 1700. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints formed in the 1800s. Yes. That there are maps from the 1700s, mm -hmm. possibly up to a century. But none of them have been found in the United States, be clear. Yes. All of these were Zero found maps in have been private found estate in sales in okay, Europe. So, in so Europe. you're saying that... The story of Lehi's journey mentions specific areas. I know one of mm -hmm. them you mentioned is the Red Sea. Yes. We've known about the Red Sea for thousands of years. Yeah. Okay. But there's other smaller areas that are mentioned, just like uh, the New Testament might mention Capernaum mm -hmm. or might mention Syria, and the Old Testament might mention, you know, Canaan or Lebanon or Jericho. Yeah, yeah. You're saying the Book of Mormon mentions specific cities, one of them called Nehom, mm -hmm. and that there have been ancient maps that have correctly identified the place of Nahom 
correctly spelled and in the location that the Book of Mormon says that it is and should be. And this all matches up archaeologically. Yes. And wow. what, what I will say is that so like that I is said, a bold claim yes. made in the bold claims town now, awesome town now they stopped okay. they stopped um so they stopped adding Nahum on maps by the time that the book of mormon was coming out so i think the last time Nahum showed up on a map i believe was like 1760 something right so okay. it dates before there so uh, you know a critic could say well joseph smith just got a hold of one of those maps there has never been a map found in the united states that has Nahum on it that dates the 1700s. All of these maps that have been discovered have all been found in Europe. Well, also, you said previously he was 14 East. years old, right? I mean, that's a pretty yeah, how audacious did he, How did he to... get this super expensive map or get Maybe access to Maybe he was it? an early adopter of MapQuest. Anybody that remembers MapQuest, I Maybe think, is old enough it. to remember, uh, yes. you know, and so the it founding really of our is, country. It really is the guess, guesses of guesses. That okay. he, that he, so it, like to us, I would say that that's the most like smoking gun definitive evidence that the Book of Mormon, um, was probably of ancient origin that you can, you can kind of lean towards that direction because it, it, it really would be crazy to think that he just guessed the name, he guessed the location and it and just did it in sequential order from the beginning of the book. Yeah. Guessing all so, of these. So where is the home spots. nowadays? So it's in modern day Yemen. And um, hopefully okay. we're going to be going back there in September. It's a little rough. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a, now we're going beyond bold claims. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Yemen, look, I saw, what was that one with Tom Cruise? Wasn't it off the coast of Yemen that he says, oh no, it was off the coast of Somalia. Somalia. Says, it's kind of the same am, place. I almost. am the captain now. <laughs> right? I mean, of, yeah. Like, so in just, terms of uh, just even more BA, Phillips, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good thing you guys are Marines. Yeah, man. so like, we're going to see on? if we can get into Yemen because... To also go along with the maps, there has been hard oh, archaeological so cool. evidences of Nahum. So in the area where Nahum is shown on the maps, there have been altars that have been found with an inscription that says, from the people of Nahum. So not only do we have maps that say it, but we have archaeological evidence that is hard archaeological evidence that hopefully doesn't get lost in the civil war that's happening there. That's why we're trying to get to Yemen, to be able to document it properly before the whole country gets destroyed because of the civil war. So you guys are like Indiana. legit Indiana Jones slash Tomb Raiders, but you're not raiding the tombs. You're just trying to get there and document before the civil war. We're like the Walmart place. version of Indiana Jones. No, well, that, but, <laughs> yeah, okay, you know, the Walmart version. I would the prefer Kirkland, Kirkland, Kirkland brand. signature, yeah. I think, is a little bit more prestigious. A little more yeah, upper, you know what I'm upper saying? Or prestigious. Mm -hmm. uh, help us out here. Andrew, is it pronounced prestigious or prestigious? What's your opinion? Prestigious. Prestigious? Yeah, I yeah. think that's a colloquial. Ah, there's the colloquial. <laughs> yeah, good Again, job. yeah, we're butchering this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if there's any question whether or not this programming is live, yeah, all right, there is your answer right <laughs> there. Okay. So we only got two minutes left here. Um, but you're claiming that all of this took you through Jordan, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. But then, this is kind of like what, like episode one and two. You're yeah. going to go then to Yemen and Oman to finish tracing this journey mm -hmm. and find even more of those evidences. It's going to get wild. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, anybody that wants to tune in, before we have to take another brief commercial break here, anybody that wants to find you guys and check out this project, how can they mm -hmm. check it out? Go on YouTube. Uh, our YouTube channel is The Stick of Joseph. Uh, very simple. And then Instagram as well, The Stick of Joseph. You can follow us on there. Um, and whether you are a, a, a follower or a critic, we want you to follow we, us. We, and, and we actually want to hear it all because we're not trying to purport uh, and, and put forth our theories of geographical evidence and stuff like that, but we just want to seek out the truth. And so... Um, yeah, please contend with us. All right. This is a special broadcast of KHTS AM 1220 FM 98.1. I am your host, Cardinalis. We're joined in the studio by Hayden and Jackson Paul talking about the stick of Joseph. We will be back in a flash. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to KHTS. This is AM 1220 and FM 98.1. We're enjoying a special broadcast right now with the crew, the producers, and the hosts of The Stick of Joseph, a documentary that uh, follows archaeological evidences, the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Book of Mormon. These guys just got back from Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, filming a whole lot of content for kind of a documentary miniseries they're putting together. And uh, it's intriguing. 
intriguing. Uh, in the first section, we we're able to talk about some of the anachronisms, some of the naysayers against the Book of Mormon and some of their claims of its inauthenticity. And then some evidences that they are, interestingly enough, kind of like a tennis match, we're able to send back over the net and debunk a little bit. And uh, now they're going to finish uh, and uh, tell us how the rest of their journey is going to be in future episodes and some of the things that they want to um, attack in the future. Uh, there's never enough time in the day to talk to you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is some intriguing stuff. I totally love it. Um, so earlier, I do want to wrap something up that you said earlier, yeah. was you had mentioned that people had had t taken issue with a part of the story of Lehi's journey. There's some small detail of him going to an area that was lush and beautiful or um, I, I don't know if tropical you use the word area. tropical or whatever you mm -hmm. used. It sounded like some kind of giant oasis or something. But that very small detail has raised the hair on the backs of some people's necks um, because they say, hey, wait a second. You know, ain't nothing in the, in the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula like that. <laughs> and uh, you you say otherwise. Yes. Well, okay, I, I, it's, I do it's, tell. Not, it's not common knowledge yeah. now. We, we're not saying anything. We're just we're just showing what, what is. But at See, the time, they could say that to me and I'd think like, oh, yeah. sure, I believe you because <laughs> I've never been. Yeah, everyone there. can Google what we're doing. Which we're is about so to cool right why here. you guys are going there and actually and checking seeing it, out. it yourselves. Yeah. Okay. So, what happens, we were, before the break, we were talking about a place called Nahum, which is an archaeological evidence. So, after, in the narrative, from Nahum, they travel nearly eastward and they travel through this big desert called the Empty Quarter. And it's the largest sand desert in the world. They sojourn there for eight years. And then from there, in the Book of Mormon narrative, they end up in a place that they called Bountiful. Now, uh, at this place, they describe how it had many fruit and it had honey and it was tropical and lush and beautiful, flowing water and all of this. Does he right? use the word tropical? Isn't that kind of a modern doesn't term? use tropical. Mm -hmm. oh, no, okay. but we're it indicates that it had that. It, it that that's just the flavor. The like flavor. if it were a video game, it looked like the background of Donkey Kong on N64. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. No, so you just put it in millennial Donkey terms. Donkey Kong okay. on N64. Yes. Yes. Okay, so, um, By the way, this is top notch programming. Yes, we are totally highbrow here <laughs> while referencing Donkey Kong. <laughs> On yeah. N64. At the end, at, okay. the, uh, at the time the Book of Mormon came out, the the idea that there was a place like Bountiful, as described in the Book of Mormon, it was absolutely ludicrous. The Arabian Peninsula was thought to be nothing but barren desert. And guess what? When you you can go on Google Earth right now, look along the two thousand miles of coast on the Arabian Peninsula, Jeez. and pretty much all of it is exactly that barren desert. Okay, but. If you if you look where Nahum is on the ancient maps that we found, and you go nearly eastward until you hit the Arabian Peninsula, there is about a forty to sixty mile area of that two thousand miles okay. that is lush, green, filled with fruit, flowing water. Really, like and if you honey. look up images, it looks like Thailand. Like yeah, it's beautiful. It's seriously, really, incredible. it's where all the Saudi princes go to vacation. It's like a vacation spot now. So the place uh, that we're talking about is called Salala. So the Book of Mormon's the original trip advisor. Yes, is what you're saying. Like, okay, advisor. okay. If you live in the first Arabian guy to rate it was you Lehi. Want to go here, yeah. He's like, <laughs> so if I wonderful. look up on TripAdvisor, <laughs> is there a 600 BC year old review that says, <laughs> yeah. you know, great honey, yeah, lush, <laughs> exactly. lush, uh, lush fruits and vegetables would yes. stay here again. Yes, would and stay so, here again. <laughs> so that's just another. Like I said, we're, we're we're hitting upon, and we've only talked about three of them. We probably have a dozen or more that we're hitting in the docu series of just like these crazy quote unquote guesses that the critics would say are guesses that would have to have had happen in sequential order in order to you know say that the Book of Mormon is false you have to say that he guessed all these things okay, and which is the, just wild to believe in the pre-show I think one of the things you'd mentioned about is how you really like analyzing and investigating some of the critics yeah um, uh, complaints here. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, if if you guys want to engage with this, check out the the Facebook live stream on hometownstation.com. dot com. You know, if you got any questions uh, for us or these guys here, we'd love to field those questions and stuff like that. Maybe in even some future shows. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned that you love studying a lot of the. Uh, anti Book of Mormon arguments yeah. to mm -hmm. kind of see like, hey, where are the credits uh, where are the critics coming from so that you can also go and investigate those claims yeah, as see well. If they hold water. Yeah, and, and, and add those to the equation. You said something about how like they had said it was impossible for Nephi to have built a ship 
back then, which again, I'm, I'm really dubious of some of these claims because it seems so modernist. Like mm-hmm. we sit so arrogantly on the shoulders of giants thinking that everybody before us was just dumb savages. We were the first and, ones to figure yeah, we're, out. And, and I look at the lives that some of these people lived and thought they're actually far more advanced than us in so many ways than one. Mm-hmm. Um, who cares if they didn't have a Tesla, you know, but anyway, yeah. um, you, you mentioned that like uh, a lot of people have criticized the idea of um, building a ship and leaving Yemen or Oman or whatever that land of Bountiful Oman. was because mm-hmm. there was no wood and there was not a tropical area. Uh, uh, but you said that you actually found a place that was a port city that traded in wood or what was the deal there? Yeah, so there's a lot of different theories. And, and that's the thing that's super interesting about this series is that because it isn't like a direct like this is what happened, this is what happened, and this is where it happened, there's a lot of questions that can be asked about – Um, Or there's a lot of room for people putting it forward different theories. So one of the theories is in that area of um, Oman, where Bountiful is, where that tropical area is, there was an ancient port city that exists for, we we don't know how long, but at least 1000 BC, that was called Korori. And Korori, um, they traded in giant timbers um, from um, the India, like across through the Indian Ocean from India. And... uh, they also worked in iron and steel and all of that in that area. They found it tons of forges. So the idea that there would have been material there to build a ship, there would have been um, maybe even uh, people to teach Nephi, Lehi, and his family how to build the ships and all that, like it's a, it's a total possibility. And, and that's at the end of the day, same with the Bible. A- anyone listening, you, you, you could never prove the Bible. And I don't think God wants us to be able to know without a shadow of a doubt that everything in the Bible is true. Because well, or that, that, your physical witness that your won't physical witness won't be 100%. Witness. Okay. Exactly. Yes, yes, but it what we're showing is that. Everything in the Book of Mormon is just as much in the realm of possibility as anything in the Bible as well. And that that still isn't enough because you need to garner that spiritual witness, which can only come from reading the text. Yeah, the physical is so cool, though. And and one of the things I would say before we wrap up here is I know there's a lot of pastors that listen to this radio station. I've I, I've dealt with them in um, in my many workings here. And I think you guys are going to love some of these physical artifacts these guys are coming back with and that this researcher Jim Gee has. And if your congregations are interested and you want to see them, like my mind was blown when just I even saw... even New Testament stuff, not yeah. just Book of Mormon. We, those we didn't even get into lamps. the New Testament stuff. Yeah, yeah those those Herodian lamps, I mean, guys, if you're a pastor of a temple local, shekels, yeah, temple shekels, if you're a pastor of a local congregation and you want to make the New Testament come alive, specifically the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ, there are some artifacts that the um, archaeological researcher these guys are working with have that are just absolutely amazing. One of them was the Herodian lamps that this famously the parable of the 10 virgins used. Mm-hmm. And when you get a hold like an original first century AD Herodian lamp. And you get to see how our paintings and modern paintings we have don't do it justice. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it kind of makes them sound like a bunch of stingy ladies that didn't want to share this ample and bounteous oil that they had. When in reality, you see these little alabaster boxes that held the precious oil and you had these small containers that were really only enough for three or four hours. And there wasn't the ability to actually share Mm -hmm. as symbolic of the fact that you actually need to be personally prepared. When you all of a sudden see the real artifacts and you put them up against the common cultural representation Presentations, and you realize the disparity between the two and how the original artifacts bring that to life and shed more context on these parables. They just hit harder. They hit different. Mm-hmm. Um, they're deeper and you feel so much deeper of a connection with the original scriptural text. Um, it's an experience for youth that is, is, is second to none. So if you want to talk to these guys um, from the stick of Joseph and you're of the, um, the Jewish or the, the common Christian perspective, I think there's a lot of common ground here that you guys would love to work with. Anyway, we got 30 seconds. Where can they find you? What's the dot com? What's the YouTube channel? So you can find us. We're on social media on Instagram at the stick of Joseph, um, as well as on our YouTube channel that our, our series isn't going to be coming out in pro- until probably the end of this year, beginning of next. But we're going to be releasing things here and there on our YouTube channel at the stick of Joseph as well. Okay, well, you guys have been listening to a special broadcast of the Stick of Joseph at KHTS. Sorry, a special broadcast at St- KHTS, AM 1220, FM 98.1 of the Stick of Joseph. This has been awesome. Hopefully, we'll hear from you guys again. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having KHTS. us. KHTS, you guys on the other side.